Um, let me start with the, my introduction. Um, so I'm Daniel. Um, I'm working in uh, as a software engineer and, and quite recently in the last few years as a CTO at Flying. We are heavily using Elixir, trying to make it big in the aviation industry, uh, building an airline distribution platform. Uh, before that, and I always mention that uh, anytime that I give a talk around visualization, that uh, I actually trained not as a, I also trained as a computer scientist, but before that I had a bit of history as an architect, and not as a software architect, but a real architect. Actually, you can see some of my old drawings in the background. And that is the main reason that many times when I approach problems in, uh, in software engineering, I go back to what I learned about uh, visual communication. And visual is always very important for me. And that's why I keep having this inspiration and keep giving talks in this topic. Uh, around usually a tool that uh, help us to visualize some kind of complexity uh, of what we are facing with. Um, yesterday, there was another talk, uh, and I was happy to, to join that. It was a bit different uh, focus, because it was focusing on the code uh, architecture. Uh, usually, the tools that I'm building is more focused on uh, whatever, whatever is happening inside the beam, so something that is after the code has been compiled. And this is something that I want to reiterate uh, today. Um, and uh, this is why the fancy title of Visual Concurrency Cookbook. So, um, as a bit of historical context, uh, some of you, uh, in, I think two years ago in Barcelona, I made a talk, something called Paparazzi, which is a tool which I uh, developed back in the time to visualize the supervision tree, uh, doing something that is quite Similar that there's already out there some quite nice tools like Visual Elixir that shows the, the supervision tree, shows how the processes and ports, uh, what kind of relationship do they have with each other, and makes it possible to, to trace uh, what is happening inside the, the beam real time. Most of the time, any kind of visualization tool or tr visual tracing tool faces the limitation that. Um, it's not safe for production. It's also not safe, whatever I'm going to show, it's also not safe for production. Uh, this tool is mainly developed for like educational use in mind or to, to challenge our own understanding about certain things about the beam internals. Um, so over the years, I was keep trying to put together something, this tool to ship it that it's easy to use and uh, uh, it can be, use for the community but i was keep rephrasing when i was going back and forth between the beam internals and understand the real complexity um, that how such a project needs to be approached but i never drop one thing a thing the name because uh, i really liked it uh, because i think it's the perfect way of uh, of expressing what is going on Inside of the air, airline virtual machine, um, we know that it's, it's not a direct implementation of the actor model. Uh, it's a concurrency pattern, but uh, it is something very close. And um, it's, on the other hand, one of the most famous implementation of the actor model, uh, maybe next to ACA. Um, so in la, inside the airline virtual machine, uh, how these actors are communicating, how they are interacting with each other, that uh, was my focus and uh, one big change that i made over the time is that i realized that um, a visualization of as uh, events are happening live it's uh, the human brain is just not capable to understanding this complexity so i i, I started to turn my attention into time traveling uh, can with the tracing tools of erlang all the events that is happening inside the virtual machine can be recorded and then maybe the internal state could be reconstructed and that means that we could create some kind of cookbook or recipes from libraries that we are using our own applications that what kind of concurrency behavior do they uh, expose 
So today I'm gonna show you uh, this tool that I built. Uh, um, let me take you through the architecture first and then the UI, and then let's jump to the live demo. And I want to explore a bit what the use case is that I think that this could be useful. And by the end of the talk, uh, uh, I would like to invite everyone to potentially collaborate in on, on this tool, try it out, test it out in your own project, challenge your own understanding of uh, concurrency patterns. So, um, I'm gonna quickly just switch over to the browser and show you uh, in five seconds how this tool looks like. But I have a couple of slides that explains that uh, all the small parts, because as you've seen in the picture, there is quite a few uh, visual vocabulary, which needs a bit of guidance. So, um, Let's see if this works. Okay. Okay, so um, how this tool works, that um, basically it makes a snapshot uh, when the tracing is enabled. Uh, there's something, some uh, part of this application, so-called uh, paparazzi recorder that you can place inside your application. It also has an integration with XUnit because whenever it's, uh, we want to see some execution, how things has happened, uh, most of the time we are looking for some significant ex executions and what is best to look at other than our own uh, test cases. So I also created uh, an integration for, for XUnit. As you can see in the background, it's a force layout. Um, usually it's, it's good to start with to lay out a bit the processes and applications a bit better. And uh, the, how this application works, and I'm gonna walk you through the UI uh, inside the slides and the visual vocabulary, that it makes it possible that uh, walks through, record everything that is happening inside uh, the beam in a certain time scale, records what are the processes or actors or ports uh, are involved in that one, and decodes all the events that can happen, uh, spawning, uh, exiting, linking, unlinking, sending messages, uh, getting a schedule uh, window, doing some garbage collection. Uh, all of these things is represented here, and I will take you through this uh, small vocabulary to be able to, for you to follow. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight, and this is the uh, part of the screen that you might uh, verse looking at, is um, that based on this uh, um, events that has been recorded, and based on the initial uh, snapshot of the system, I can travel back and forth in time and show how, for example, a parallel map implementation builds up its own processes, sets up the link, and then after everything has been processed, uh, destroys the whole hierarchy. So going back to the slides, uh, what is the architecture of this, uh, of this tool chain? As I mentioned, um, the first element is a paparazzi recorder. Uh, it has almost no dependency. Uh, you can just add it, uh, like it actually has no dependency at all. So it's a few lines of Elixir code. Maybe in the future, it would be nice to rewrite the thing in Erlang. So that means that when we are observing the system, uh, even though there is one process around there, which is works as a tracer, collects information, it doesn't affect uh, the process architecture, doesn't affect the communication. So you can actually see the real thing that is happening in the background. What this rep recorder does that uh, you can start it, stop it, it's a global process and then it collects all the information that is necessary to build up, uh, heavily relying on the uh, Erlang tracer. And, uh, and when, the, when the recording has been done, then it dumps out the information in temporary files, binary files, to be able to read out from Paparazzi Analyzer. Paparazzi Analyzer, which kind of provides an API, it's a Phoenix application, provides an API for the UI that you've just seen, uh, just like the tool that has been presented yesterday, um, this is also built in D3, 
D3 is the short version for DDD, uh, Data Driven D Documents. It's a visualization tool set uh, that has been around for quite some time. Um, in the front end uh, platform, new frameworks are uh, emerging almost every week, but I still believe that uh, D3 is the best uh, tool for such a challenge to build something very customized and kind of easily maintainable and, uh, and that it does, doesn't really uh, put limitations or constraints on the imagination. So let's look at quickly the DUI. Um, in the background uh, that is floating around is, uh, is the supervision tree, but it also represents other type of relationships, not just links. It also represents monitors. It also represents connections uh, because uh, ports um, can be connected to, to processes, uh, but it's limited to them. Uh, although, and I will mention in the limitation, there are other type of hierarchies or other kind of relationships between processes that could be displayed uh, that can help potentially to understand uh, why the system behaves the way it behaves. Uh, but I haven't yet covered that. Uh, let me mention a few. Um, for example, since uh, latest, uh, some of the latest versions, I think since one year or maybe even more now, um, Elixir collects in the process dictionary um, ancestors and callers, which is very interesting uh, relationships as well to highlight, which is not necessarily the same as that, let's say the, the initial call uh, as it's reported by the beam. Um, and also group leadership uh, is another example that is not present, represented here, uh, how each of the processes uh, passes over I related information uh, to each other. So that is the main part of the back, uh, background or the UI. Um, this is a temporal graph. That means that it not just defines the nodes, which the nodes can be processes and ports, as I said, as edges can be links, monitors, and connections, but also uh, builds up from all the small events that has happened or have been recorded, uh, a temporal representation of the graph. So every, every uh, single step in the uh, airline virtual machine uh, will be represented here, and then it can be reconstructed, hopefully correctly, which was always my doubt uh, in, in this graph. So the next uh, uh, UI element is uh, in, the, uh, in the bottom of the screen, which is the event history with the time traveling function. Um, what is important to know that this reddish uh, rectangle represents the, the current event in, in, uh, in focus. And whatever, uh, it shows the zero, which is the moment that the, the capture of the traces, the capture of the events has been started. And what basically this tool does, that it builds up from that initial capture and applies uh, all the single events uh, into the graph. And also this place here, that how do they uh, in, uh, um, interact with each other. Okay, um, there is one component uh, which is floating over the graph that links the two things together. Uh, first of all, it highlights the payload of the event in focus and also shows that what are the actors involved. Uh, there is two types of uh, interactions and events that can happen in the actor model, uh, event that only concerns one single actor and uh, event that concerns two actors. Uh, in the actor model, there is no, no other type of events has uh, been displayed. That's why you can see that if you see vertically, um, and maybe I should jump to the next one, uh, because on the left-hand side of the screen, and which shows for every single horizontal line, that for that single process, as we are going uh, back and forth in time, uh, what are the events happening on its timeline, uh, how it gets scheduling and how it interacts with other processes. And as you can see, there are some events like this one, uh, which considers just only the single process, uh, 
processor port or uh, this one which is sending messages and this is a reading from the message box. Okay, so let's, let's go through quickly the, uh, the cast, our actors. Um, if there is no letter or there's a field circle in my um, uh, representation, graph representation of nodes, it always uh, refers to a generate process. Uh, maybe it's just represented by its speed or, or port identifier, or if there's a register name around, then I do display that register name uh, because it makes it easier to interpret the, the structure of the application. Uh, there is two type of behaviors or roles that it was easy to, uh, to deduct from the process dictionary or or from any kind of tools or any kind of helpers of the um, of the uh, Erlang standard library. So one of them is the application. The application is a special behavior. Uh, usually in the supervision tree, uh, the application controller is a very uh, middle, and then uh, as applications are started by the virtual machine they start to pop up around the application controller and the applications are the one that uh, uh, covering also from folder and CSPEX uh, applications as it's defined by OTP. Um, the applications themselves are represented by an A inside the, the circle. There is supervisor, we all know this uh, very special behavior. Um, especially in the supervision in this here, it makes sense to represent them. Uh, from the initial call that is registered in the beam, it's, it's, uh, there's a chance to deduct uh, what type of process we are dealing with. Uh, they have S uh, on their circle. And then the last actor, because at least to my understanding, uh, ports are also part of the actor model, although they have some limitations compared to generate processes. Ports are the way to interact with the external world, but uh, they still can be connected. Uh, they still take part in the for trans behavior. Uh, so connected to processes, they have their message boxes. So, uh, and the ports are represented in this, uh, in my uh, visual vocabulary as uh, just only a stroke circle, but with just white fill inside. So let's go to relationships. Uh, three relationships are represented in this model. Um, the first one is the link. Uh, anytime uh, that two actors are linked, let's say about a spawn link or just setting up a link uh, separately. Um, this uh, continuous line between the two actors is shown up and rendered. Um, both processes and ports can be linked. Uh, monitors. Uh, monitor is a way of, um, uh, it's also something that is uh, directly supported by the, supported by the virtual machine, that uh, uh, it's possible to supervise or check the behavior of certain processes without getting too much involved in, uh, in, uh, in a linked behavior when uh, some failures might uh, needs to be isolated uh, specifically. So monitors, they are directional. Uh, ports cannot monitor. Only processes can monitor, but processes can monitor ports and uh, processes, other processes as well. They are represented by the dashed gray line and they are directional. So they are showing their knowledge, uh, showing their direction. Um, connections as a last thing. Um, as I mentioned that uh, ports, um, and it's quite useful to be able to render some graph that, uh, it's, uh, that it's easy, makes it easier to understand the application architecture because sometimes ports are not linked to other processes. Uh, but the only way that they connect uh, other than having some kind of messaging patterns or call patterns, uh, with other processes is uh, because they are always associated to one single process. And this connection between important processes is represented by this uh, uh, bit thicker uh, gray dashed line. 
Okay, so um, let's jump back now uh, to the application. And let me take you through uh, that uh, what is happening here and what are each of uh, these uh, elements represent. Let me quickly check the, uh, no, okay, it's a bit complicated to check. Hopefully everybody sees well. Um, okay, so let's go through now uh, the events, the event vocabulary. So when the tracer is set up, um, with the Erlang tracer, it's possible to register what kind of events we are interested in. in. In many cases, setting up all the events and tracing all the events is not a good idea. But for such an educational tool, this actually gives the chance to, to be able to try to reconstruct uh, the application state. So uh, in Paparazzi, uh, the tracing is set to all processes and every type of event that can be technically uh, observed. Um, this example uh, is shows uh, a, a runtime behavior of, uh, of a parallel map. I hope it's visible well. This parallel map, we all know parallel map. This, this is one of the classical example which shows the capabilities of, um, um, of, uh, of the concurrency behavior. So uh, what it does that it uh, starts for processes and for each process with a task, which is a behavior uh, defined by Elixir on top, it, uh, it duplicates the, uh, each of the element that it passed through it and then awaits for it and then it's tear down the, the whole parallel map. Let's have a look. How does this uh, look uh, in, the, in Paparazzi itself? So um, first I'm gonna zoom out, but uh, most of the time, as you see, this is the whole uh, uh, application structure. Everything is running in one single node, uh, but most of the, most of the applications which are color coded is not relevant. Uh, this specific example is, uh, is traced by this X unit integration. As you've seen, uh, when there is like a test suite, the test suite can be executed. And then uh, from the beginning of the test case to the end of the test case, everything is traced. So let's focus our attention here. Uh, this, is, this process is the test process. And this is the one that is actually in the context the 182 of the test process. And uh, as you can see, it manages most of the communication uh, with other processes. And what it does that four times uh, sets up, spawns a new process, links it to the uh, original process, and then sends it a message. Uh, let's see it from a bit closer. Uh, Every, every event, like I decided to go for a visual representation of these events, that um, if there is uh, one active uh, behavior from the process, because this is uh, a spawn uh, event, then um, it's, not fi it's filled with black. And then when it's like a passive, then it just creates or uh, uh, schedules the creation of the, that process later on, it's not filled. Uh, the second step that it sets up a link still for uh, a process that doesn't exist yet. And then uh, that process, the first process that is created for the parallel map uh, has been created at that point and uh, it also get linked and then uh, the, the test process has sent one single message. I do represent usual um, uh, ti timeline related uh, events with triangles because it kind of has a direction and it starts or stops behavior. Uh, represent uh, message passing related behavior with uh, boxes. Uh, the plus that means that we are placing a message in the, in the mess uh, message box 
uh, and the minus that we are reading up from it. Let's follow quickly the, the lifeline of this process. It has been created. That's what the dashed line shows. Uh, but still, the, the, the process haven't started to process that single message and duplicate that value uh, because it's waits for scheduling. Uh, and this is what this wine background represents that if uh, one process has a scheduling window and as soon as it gets the scheduling window, it uh, does uh, receive, read out that, that message uh, from its message box. Uh, it duplicates it and sends it back to the original process. As you see, the double, double of one is two, and then it exits. And if you are looking on the, on the bigger scale behavior, that this is what you can see, that all four processes has been created, connected, all of them gets a message placed on their message, uh, message queue, and then uh, all of them does their job, sends back the information to the original process, and then slowly starts to steer, uh, uh, tear down uh, the connection because what this represents that uh, uh, how uh, these processes are unlinked from each other. Okay, uh, and as you see, when there's an X, that means uh, it's the end of the uh, life, life cycle of the process and, um, and there is no dotted lines following after. Uh, I think uh, it's taking longer than I thought, so I'm quickly jumping back to my slides to quickly wrap it up. So uh, how is it standing, these two right now? Um, uh, uh, it's actually ready to be published in GitHub. I haven't done it yet because I was a bit busy <laughs> just before, uh, as also to, to uh, quote uh, yesterday's talk, it was also a bit conference driven development, but it's ready to be used, ready to be tested and checked through your own application. Uh, what uh, for the future, what I'm planning to do, which is a quite interesting, that um, to be able to, to investigate more complex patterns uh, and uh, not to overload the human brain, uh, many times the communication, all the events that is happening in the sequential timeline is um, there's a lot of repetition happening. Usually we are waiting for something, fetching uh, some kind of uh, state. And uh, if I would have the chance, which it turned out to a quite uh, complex mathematical challenge, how to find this minimum repetition representation, basically compressing the timeline that um, could lead to a representation of the timeline, just like in musical notation, you say that from this moment to this moment, you just do it a hundred times. And then we can just focus our attention to the important bits. Uh, what are the limitations? There are still some occasional memory leak and some crash. Uh, it's mainly because um, JavaScript, I'm still struggling to learn into the internal parts, how to really have a bit better control. As I mentioned, ancestors, callers, and bootladers are uh, not yet covered. And then um, and a general cleanup of the code uh, for easy contribution, although I think that the tool is ready to be used as, uh, as an educational tool, but uh, to be able to scale it and see and uh, welcome contribution, a bit of cleanup is still needed um, because the iterative development of uh, figuring out the internal, it it's always makes two big loops and that's why uh, this is uh, still Ending. And so, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I couldn't cover everything, but um, and hopefully uh, the, the tech demo or the tool demo itself will uh, already uh, raise some interesting questions.